he had to now become almost like a wartime treasury secretary. Because people forget that the global war on terror didn't start with military tank rolling somewhere into a foreign country. It started with treasury and economic sanctions. Hello, I'm Ed D'Agostino from Malden Economics. And this week, we discuss the weaponization of the US dollar and how it has changed the world order. We also uncover how a strong US dollar contributed to decades of suffering by the middle class and the loss of our manufacturing base. My guest this week is Saleya Mosin, author of the important book, Paper Soldiers. Welcome to Global Macro Update. Saleya, I really appreciate you joining me. I thoroughly enjoyed the book, and it's pretty interesting to be speaking about the, the, the U.S. dollar and the strength of the dollar at a time when uh, very, very recently we saw volatility in the bond market and the stock market, all driven by uh, the yen getting stronger against the dollar. I'm, I'm really curious if you have any thoughts about what just happened. I feel like it's just one of those cases where markets have a playbook. They've built out what their prediction is for what's going to happen. And anytime the Fed tries to interrupt that, there's a tantrum. But the world's largest central bank will not be bullied <laughs> by markets, it seems. Uh, what It's been interesting to watch the developments, though, right? We saw the yen, as you said, get stronger, but also people poured into the treasuries market. So it remains a safe haven. Uh, even though people talk a lot about de-dollarization and waning or diminishing U.S. power, uh, when you get to the cold, hard facts, the U.S. is still a place to come in moments when there is risk. So that's a great setup for this conversation and and what you mapped out in the book. So let's let's get into it because your, your your book outlines sort of a a long, long history of currency manipulation by all governments. Uh, and then you sort of get into why uh, it's problematic when the U.S. plays such a game, because we are the the providers of the world's reserve currency. Uh, and, and you go back to Treasury Secretary Bob Rubin back in the, the Clinton administration, and he sort of honed the the craft of explaining to the world why the U.S. hews to to a strong dollar. Can you get into why that? is such an important view for a treasury secretary to have? Absolutely. And as with most things, the landscape and context is really, really important. So, and I go through this in the book, as you know, Ed, um, the, when Bill Clinton came into office and Bob Rubin was, you know, became the second treasury secretary in the Clinton administration, the U S had seen more than a decade, maybe even two decades of volatility in currency markets where governments around the world were intervening and trying to bully traders. And then traders in return were frustrated and tried to bully back. And a lot of that was playing out through, you know, we had the Plaza Accord, the Louvre Accord in the 80s, where governments were coming in and and purposely and secretly getting together to manipulate the value of the dollar and other currencies. Uh, we saw it all happening through wordplay. What word did a, a finance minister or treasury secretary use? And so when Bob Rubin took office as treasury secretary, currencies loomed large. He knew that walking in and it did for the next decade in the U.S. and for any Treasury Secretary, it loomed large on, the, large on the agenda. And it turns out that in that moment, Rubin was able to use uh, his knowledge, his deep knowledge of how markets operate and how market movers and traders react in different situations. He brought that knowledge with him, but also he brought his training of understanding that each word that you use matters. And that's what I really tried to get at in the beginning of the book, that any utterance by a treasury secretary could move markets, whether um, the secretary of the day is using the word um, uh, as, you know, for some time, those three words, how long has the dollar been too strong for some time now? That is a signal, you know? Traders kept like a tally of how many times Ruben used different words. And so he decided, well, I'm going to meet these traders where they're at 
and fight with the same tools that they use against the treasury and that they use to kind of work through markets and that angst, those are words and words matter. So he really kind of elevated that game and made everyone realize we need to listen carefully. Uh, otherwise, you're going to miss some clues and maybe lose some money. And he really sort of set the the template for future treasury secretaries in terms of how to communicate. I think you have a, a couple of good examples in the book where treasury secretaries deviated from that and there were there were effects globally. Absolutely. Bob Rubin's shadow uh, in the world of treasury secretaries and treasury officials loomed long and large for years to come. Uh, part of it was because he uh, soothed currency markets at a time when that soothing was really necessary. Uh, he fought the Asian financial crisis that had a lot of a lot to do with cr- currencies. He brought the temperature down uh, between governments and uh, foreign exchange traders and markets and across different finance ministers. He started the process of, of bringing that temperature down. And after him came Larry Summers. But after that, Came And Larry Summers was very much seen as a student of Rubens at the time and Clinton uh, because he came up through sort of behind uh, Rubin and his footsteps. After Rubin, we had two Treasury secretaries under W. Bush who back to back who were not from financial markets. And it was juxtaposed in a way where all of a sudden it was so clear why you want a treasury secretary that understands financial markets and the plumbing and has the faith and has of investors and has gravita with investors because those two secretaries under W Bush those first two that he had who were from industry and you know aluminum and paper making industries rather than money making industries there was a disconnect between what Treasury was trying to say and do and what investors were understanding. And they really missed Rubin and his influence in those years. But you're right, Ed, Rubin set the playbook. He created the playbook of this is how you talk about the dollar. And when I say he created the playbook, I'm not speaking metaphorically. There was actual documentation inside the Treasury Department, letters and memos written by civil servants that said this is how Rubin did it and this is how it should go forth. Well, you brought up George Bush. I want to talk about that period a little bit because uh, one of the things that started to come to light at that point is the downside of such a strong dollar. And you had, uh, I mean, again, going back to the yen, right? At, At that point, there were several people in the heartland of this country, specifically the CEOs of of car companies and steel companies who said, uh, the dollar's too strong relative to the yen. And this is causing problems for us. We're, we're, we're losing our ability to sell in our own country. Maybe it was thought that maybe one of uh, Bush's Treasury secretaries, Jon Snow, might do something about that. Can you talk about kind of what, may, what, what sort of happened when there was even a little look in that direction? Absolutely. It was actually a very exciting time. This is pre-9-11, right? So this is when uh, George W. Bush had a pre-9-11 agenda uh, about economic growth and uh, focusing on domestic policies versus foreign policy and national security and overseas, and which is hard to imagine now because he only had about nine months of of that, or uh, yeah, nine months of that. So what we had was um, W. Bush's very first Treasury Secretary. His name was Paul O'Neill, and he kind of came out of, out of nowhere. And as a reporter now, if I'm uh, trying to figure out who might be the next Treasury Secretary, there's a joke in the newsroom that be careful. It could just be someone from a random industry that you've never heard of. Because in the world of Bloomberg and markets, we've heard of all the potential candidates who could come from the world of finance. But if someone were to name a titan of another industry, it would be a little bit of a a learning curve there, right? So Paul O'Neill, he becomes a Treasury Secretary. He is named in the beginning, and I unpack this in detail in the book, that he was one of the most um, uh, celebrated or applauded uh, cabinet members to be named um, in that period between Election Day and Inauguration Day in 2000 and the beginning of 2001, uh, Bush was, was you know, he had got a big round of applause for choosing someone. And even markets were kind of like, you know, he probably understands different parts of industry and different parts of the world and the manufacturing sector. And then slowly there was this concern, you know, well, will the strong dollar mantra that Rubin coined, which is basically the explanation, the playbook of how a treasury secretary should talk about 
um, the dollar, saying a strong dollar is in the nation's interest and try to always use the same boring six to eight words to talk about it just to cool people's anxieties around it. Is he going to adopt that playbook? Because it's a different party. Is it? Is this a, a bipartisan or a partisan strategy for the um, Treasury Department? There was a lot of questions about it. And then all of a sudden, um, you know, the New York Times in, in that moment wrote a story about how, well, Paul O'Neill comes from an industry, the paper industry, where uh, you want, or sorry, the aluminum industry, where uh, aluminum makers want a weaker dollar because they are focused on exporting their product overseas and that's beneficial to them. All of a sudden, there was this fur across Washington and across markets of like, maybe he is going to abandon a strong dollar policy. Maybe we are back to seeing a U.S. government that actively wants a weaker dollar. And in his in the hearing, by the time we get to his confirmation hearing a couple of days after Inauguration Day, that is the first thing O'Neill talks about. He has his whole um, cheering section sitting behind him, his wife, his kids, a couple of grandchildren. Instead of thanking them for being there and and thanking anyone for you know the nomination or any kind of opening statement, he looks directly at the senators, a glance at the cameras and reporters that are there, and it's not cable TV cameras, but like the you know actual snap photos, and says, "Look, everyone's at wondering what I feel about the dollar and what I think about the dollar, and I'm here to tell you that." I will abide by Rubin's policy. He adopts it. And reporters run from the room to call their editors. This is 2000 cell phones and laptops and you can't text your editor. They run out and it hits markets. And there is an immediate calm. But he was never really able to persuade investors that he truly understood the plumbing of markets and, and what they dealt with. This whole time period sort of sets the stage, right? If there's a decade or decades of strong dollar policy. And there is a hollowing out of the middle class in America as a result of it. And that is a big topic today. I mean, we, we deal with it today. And one of the brilliant aspects of your book is you really, it, you you take a different path to explaining sort of how did we get to this period where populism is so strong in this country? And I never really connected the dots um, you know, you, you hear talk about NAFTA and, and the hollowing out of, of middle America and the loss of jobs. But I never really heard it framed around the, the strength of the U.S. dollar, which I thought yeah. was was brilliant. Thank you, Ed. Yeah, for me, it was um, intellectually, it was a bit of a lived experience because I started covering the Treasury Department in um, early 2016. And then when Trump came into office, I covered Stephen Mnuchin's Treasury Department. I had a front row seat. Um, covering that department under Stephen Mnuchin, but also just all of Trump's economic policies coming out of the White House, um, the Republican agenda, and then Congress's agenda coming out of, you know, that side of um, Washington, and also talking to folks on Wall, Wall Street and market makers and talking to industry and then traveling with Mnuchin, without Mnuchin, uh, to the heartland. I'm from Cincinnati, Ohio, so I have strong ties to the actual Rust Belt. At the time, Ohio was still a swing state um, uh, in the country. And I really saw with my own eyes that um, why populism was a surprise to people and why it was with so many things were overlooked. And it, part of it was that people just kept seeing the glass half full, not realizing that the empty glassers, the people who lost out and never fully recovered from the global financial crisis, and the people who did not benefit from the globalization efforts, that they finally were heard by Donald Trump when he hit when he came down those golden escalators. And to me, being a treasury reporter, I really did see that there is a connection between the dollar policy. And when I went back and, you know, for the book, researched what Bob Rubin and all of the secretaries between him and Trump and Mnuchin uh, said about the dollar policy and what they had hoped it would become, um, I saw two things. One, I saw a series of people who did not want to talk about currency policy, right? It's this kabuki game. When I first took on the beat, I read all the autobiographies by Paulson, Geithner, Rubin, and they have like maybe a few sentences or paragraphs on the dollar. 
and the dollar policy. So I was, I thought I'm going to write a whole book on this. And I reported a lot over those years, not knowing I was going to write a book. But the second thing that I saw was that they all applauded globalization, acknowledged that it's not a winner for everyone, but no one really took the courageous next step of trying to fix that and raise an alarm that it's not working for everyone and those people need a voice, we need to listen to them. Now, when I spoke to some of these men who now have hindsight, they said, well, had I stayed in Congress longer, sorry, at Treasury longer, or had Democrats held on to um, Congress longer, or if it Republicans had more time um, in office, then we would have gotten to these problems. The whole point was to install these policies and economic agenda that was very sort of pro-globalization and then go and address these problems. But the... Um, concerns were percolating and bubbling up in Congress for a long time. Uh, in Paul O'Neill's hearing, confirmation hearing that I just talked about, Senator Max Baucus from Montana talked about how globalization isn't for everyone, right? And at the time, Wall Street did not want to hear from a Treasury Secretary who um, empathized with that. So it was this Wall Street versus Main Street. And that's why in the book, I, in Paper Soldiers, I take readers into the halls of power in Washington. So Congress, White House, inside the very room where Rubin and Geithner as a civil servant and other people sat and came up with this strong dollar policy. But I also take you to the heartland. I take you to Moraine, Ohio and Weirton, West Virginia to see and really understand how those decisions in Washington about something as esoteric uh, that people don't think about on a day-to-day -day, um, basis as currency policy affects their lives. You're from Ohio. I live in Connecticut. Um, it's it's not just the heartland. I mean, Connecticut at one point in the not too long ago, 20 years ago, I remember it, we were dominant in uh, metal processing. There were, there were machine shops all over Connecticut. And for the most part, they're gone. Majority of them are gone. And you get outside of Fairfield County, outside of the Wall Street influence into what I call the real part of Connecticut. Uh, the evidence is everywhere. There's a lot of um, towns that you can tell when you drive through used to be very affluent and clearly no longer are. So W. Bush's second Treasury Secretary was John Snow, who was from Ohio. He was also from industry. And he grew up in a family and around in a community where people who worked in manufacturing did not have, they had high school degrees, maybe they had associate's degrees, but not college educated, but they become, became millionaires in the tool dye, tool making, you know, business. And all of a sudden those jobs and those opportunities had been sucked away. But Jon Snow, one of the treasury secretaries of the early 2000s that markets Wall Street did not like, he understood that part of the country. And ultimately this, this, story uh, that you outline in the book moves to China. So it moves away from Japan and, and, and into U.S. trade relations with China until the Trump presidency. Why do you think that this issue, when it was so obvious, that all you had to do was drive across the country to see it and, and you didn't even have to go very far. Just leave Fairfield County, right? Like <laughs> I said, why, why did it never come up? Why was it never addressed? Was it simply, as you say, just the power of Wall Street overwhelming the rest of the country? I feel like it's simple and not simple. It's such a good question. And we should be asking each other and ourselves this frequently, I think. So talking about is about it is important. I think one is that, look, 9-11 happened and it upended everything. That was an assault on American soil. And of course, it is going to shake the country to its core. And so all of a sudden, the attention that was on domestic policies wasn't there anymore. We, America had to focus overseas. And I, I write about this in, in the book. I, there's a whole chapter on just what was happening inside the Treasury Department, where the Secretary, Treasury Secretary was in Tokyo and how he flew back on a military, an icy cold military plane back because he had to now become almost like a wartime Treasury Secretary. Um, because people forget that the global war on terror didn't start with military tank rolling somewhere into a foreign country. It started with Treasury and economic sanctions. So that, that shift into an actual weaponization of the dollar is what took the focus away from making sure that we're putting band-aids and, and fixing other problems that are 
um, bubbling up as a result of a shift toward globalization. The other one, you know, once that kind of maybe got under control or you know, the attention shifted, then we had a global financial crisis, which is of America's making, right? It's from the subprime uh, housing market problems. And so um, that was another huge distraction, right? And then when the recovery from that crisis was cemented, that was the moment for all establishment traditional policymakers in Washington to return to uh, the, the, the problems in the heartland. And it was Trump who came and maybe Bernie Sanders, people who were so-called fringe politicians who came in and said, hey, guys, you're not paying attention to this. But the U.S.-China, you're right, we should talk about that a little bit. U.S.-China, and I go through it, there's a chapter, I think I called it a turbulent marriage because they, they the two countries need each other, especially during the global financial crisis. In the aftermath, China held a lot of U.S. treasuries. And so they had a right to know as this giant investor in the U.S. economy, what is going on? Um, and the U.S. needed to answer to them and needed their cooperation because they needed to maintain those investments. But then China can't really pull out of those investments because their holdings were so huge that to start pulling out would mean they would eventually take a loss. And it's just this virtuous cycle where they were so deeply intertwined in like this joint headlock that neither was willing to release and neither was willing to punch each other in the eye. Right, right. I could go on and on about about the whole heartland issue because it's so important, but I want to make sure we we move into what your book is ultimately about, which is the weaponization of the dollar because you you point out so eloquently that for decades uh the the path for foreign relations was diplomacy and then the next step was armed conflict right and today it's diplomacy and then it moves to sanctions of different degrees uh you know and and oftentimes that avoids war which is ultimately a good thing can can you talk a little bit about how the dollar became a weapon? What what was that real point in time where the U.S. government realized this is this is a really powerful tool that we can wield? I think the strongest moment in history where it became a weapon is nine eleven. Uh, before then, um, the sanctions unit inside of Treasury, the, which is called OFA, uh, Office of Foreign Assets Control. And in the book I do, I went into that office. I paint a very vivid picture of what this secretive, tiny little office, but very powerful office in Washington looks like, feels like, smells like, and, and is like, and who's in there. Um, they It was considered an orphan of Treasury, right? There was no uh, terrorism financial intelligence unit as Treasury. Treasury was either domestic or international, or it was a secret service because it used to be part of Treasury until uh, the Patriot Act. And so it was it was 9-11 when that happened. Um, the uh, administration, the Bush administration realized that in order to prevent another attack from happening and to find out how they even carried out the attack that did happen on 9-11, we need to understand how money was used because they had to pay for it somehow. That money had to move through the system. And it turns out it opened and it moved in broad daylight. That attack cost maybe a couple of hundred thousand dollars in 2001 money, right? 25 years later, that's a different number, but it didn't cost that much considering what it did. Um, it moved in broad daylight. So the power of the dollar is that the U.S. can then track how much our, the dollar moves, who's using what bank account. And I do go into in this chapter called um, the crystal ball of terror, uh, how the Treasury Department uh, lobbied um, a this the organization called SWIFT, which is kind of like the Gmail of the banking system to say, hey, you see real time transactions happening. Can we access some of that data? Because maybe we will see the financial footprints toward the next attack or who the financial or the terrorist organizations are that are raising money, where the money is coming from for these attacks. And they did thwart several attacks. And I lay that out in the book. And that is a weaponization, right? You, you use the dollar or the dollar's ownership and hold over the global financial system to say to adversaries, stop, you don't have access to the global financial system in full or in part or in whole anymore because you are violating the terms of that agreement. You're violating our democratic values. It is a privilege and not a right to have access. And we have said, decided you're done. And that 
also we saw that it is cheaper than um, kinetic action, outright war. Uh, you don't have to spill American blood. You don't have to send troops overseas and tanks and and all of those things. And so um, it is this this space, you know, sanctions developed even more in this space between words and war. So words are is I'm talking about diplomacy, talking to each other, don't attack us, those kinds of things. And then you could jump to war. We're going to go, we're going to invade. There is a space in between called sanctions to get people, it's a deterrent or it's a punishment, as we've seen with um, uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And so that developed from 9-11 on. And from 9-11 till about 2020, the use of economic sanctions grew by about a thousand percent. And that is both Republican wow. and Democrat. That is Trump and that is not Trump. That is everybody. Congress wanted to use um, sanctions more. Treasury, state, the intelligence community, armed services all talked about sanctions more because they could see that it's um, not that expensive. It has a big impact. Uh, there's a lot of discussion these days about whether they're um, if effective or not, that's a little bit of a separate question we can get to. Um, but in the book, I unpack exactly how um, the the U.S. realized that it has this weapon with 9-11, how it stood up an entire unit inside of Treasury called the Terrorism and Final, Financial Intelligence Unit and what all of the qualities of that unit are. Um, the U.S. Treasury Department is the only finance ministry in the world that has its own intelligence service, basically, an intelligence office. Um, and it has actually been used to thwart war and protect not just the U.S., but also allies. You bring us close to today with that. And before I read your book, a long time before I read your book, I was writing to our audience about how I felt like, and, and you've addressed it as well in your book, how we may have crossed the line. In February of 22, when Russia invaded Ukraine, we took pretty dramatic actions. You know, we, we ramped sanctions up to a new level. Uh, we, we seized assets of, of a foreign government. Um, we, when I say we, it wasn't just the U S it was the, 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 the collective West. Uh, we seized assets of Russian citizens w without a trial. Um, this was, this was a really big leap. And I wrote at the time that I felt, feel like this may be a point that we look back at years later as a breaking point where other governments and certainly wealthy individuals say the rule of law is not respected there anymore. Um, and I am not from that country. Um, I, I need to look elsewhere. I need to diversify. And that might have been sort of the, the Jenga piece, if you will, that that came out of the U.S. dollar uh, being a reserve currency for, 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 for decades to come. What are your thoughts on that? And how, how do you feel about that move? Was that an important time for the dollar? Oh, absolutely. I start and end the book with that precise moment. Uh, I pulled out the book because I wanted to remind myself the first sentence is that it is possible that 5.13 p.m. on Saturday, February 26th on 2022 will one day be seen as the precise moment uh, the ebb of the dollar empire began. And I want to pre pre preface that statement with one piece of information that the dollar has reigned supreme since the 1940s and slowly gained more and more power. And that's what the book is. I really, I tell the story of America's rise as a democracy and as a country against the backdrop of our economic prowess and the dollar. Um, every decade there is, predictions of the dollar's demise. In the 90s, oh, the yen is going to overtake the dollar's prowess. In the early 2000s, the euro was a new kid on the block that everyone wanted to hang out with. In the 2010s, it was, oh, global financial crisis. Did the U.S. just lose all panache? And it turns out, no, people were pile. even though the U.S. contributed or maybe caused that whole crisis, people were piling into the dollar and treasuries uh, as a safe haven. And now we're talking about the Russia invasion, but the landscape has changed <clears throat> with that invasion and with a couple of other things, populism on the rise and the China-led coalition getting stronger. And we have seen this debate of de-dollarization really kick off once again, but against a very 
a shaky backdrop because we're also seeing internal domestic issues. The whole concept of the dollar as a reserve asset is derived from the fact that the U.S. is a strong democracy. We have rule of law. We have independent courts and institutions like the Federal Reserve. We have free and fair elections that are um, predictable in the sense we know they're on November 5th. We know on January 20th there is a, um, a handover in power unless there's a second term, all of those things. And slowly we are seeing a lot of those key pillars to our democracy that give strength to the dollar as the world's reserve asset. We're seeing chinks in that armor. You know, we talk about rule of law. There's questions about that in the country. We're talking about um, independent agencies. The Federal Reserve is under fire because of missing inflation and some actions during the global financial crisis and uh, some of their ethics scandals that are coming out. The Supreme Court is under fire um, because of ethics scandals and some of their decisions. So American trust between, you know, the trust between the public and public institutions that is at a all time low. And that is a big, big deal. Um, so it is scary. Um, I think we are at an inflection point, but at the same time, there are a couple of things to remember. Cause to me, this book was a bit of an act of patriotism for me. I, as an American, I am a optimist. So I do end on an optimistic note. Um, and even though it's been a year since I put my pen down on the conclusion, I stand by it, uh, even considering everything that's happened in the past year and that may happen the next year. A couple of things are undeniable that um, to be the world's reserve asset, you have to be the world's largest economy. And the U.S. is so far ahead on that race for number one uh, that you would have to take numbers two, three and four and combine them to become bigger than the U.S., that is how far we are as number one to the number two. The second point that I would make is that um, no matter what happens internally, uh, the flight to risk, flight from risk and flight to safety globally is the U.S. Whether even if there's d domestic financial, economic or political turmoil or instability, people still pile into the U.S., which just is fact that investors see the country as a safe haven. We will pay off our debts. Uh, we will abide by, you know, we will maintain, uphold the laws. The public has enough love and affection for a free and fair democracy that it will withstand the challenges. Um, the other point that I think is important to make is that America's history shows that uh, the country can persevere. It's, it's a country that has been checkered with these kinds of challenges. Being a d democracy means that we will have self-critical moments. They will play out in front of everybody. We air our dirty laundry, civil war, civil rights act, countless number of things. And it's easy to point to those and say, well, that was different because we know exactly how that got sorted out. And right now we're in the fog of of war with our, right. ourselves and, and how we feel about our democracy. Um, so if you look at the past as an example and some of these other facts, uh, it looks like the dollar will and the U.S. will maintain its clout. And there's really no great alternative. I mean, I, 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 I've talked about it. Others talk about it. The, the, what we're doing to the dollar could, could, could be dangerous. But then you think about what is the alternative? And there's... There aren't any options, at least not any good ones. What do you think about that? What what could be an alternative? Yeah, the alternative discussion is interesting. There really isn't. Um, one point I like, I, I want to make is that uh, while there, it is true, it is just fact that there are no alternatives, and I'll unpack that in just a moment. The fact that we hear now administration officials, the sitting Treasury Secretary, talk about the fact that, well, there's no alternatives, even the Fed chair has said that, it shows a defensive posture and being on the back foot is new. We never, the U.S. US officials never had to say, well, there's nowhere else because no one ever questioned that cloud. And I think that is a small but significant shift. But at the same time, so what? Let's unpack them. People talk about Bitcoin or a crypto. I don't think investors are ready for any asset that is not backed by a government or a central bank to be the world's reserve asset. Uh, there's just too much uncertainty there. You talk about China, there is not enough transparency in China in its markets and how the state does or doesn't have influence over its market, its um, interest rates and the value of its currency. 
People talk about the euro, which is backed by a monetary union, but not a fiscal union. And also they don't have the depth of debt instruments that is required or beneficial to have in a reserve asset the way you have with treasuries. Um, Also just sheer size makes it hard. Um, The big, the one that people talk about the most is, you know, maybe it wouldn't be a single currency, but a combination of currencies. Um, or sort of a neutral currency that could take over. You know, people talk about the BRICS plus effort to work around the dollar. Those are things of concern. Um, but at the same time, the dollar does not need to be at it. the current heights. Right now, I think the dollar is at on one end of 92% of global transactions. If that goes to 80%, I don't see how that's all of a sudden the dollar king dollar is dethroned right it does not need to have that amount of power in order to remain influential and important and also you have to think about the BRICS plus countries they are not run by open democracies um and backed by open democracies so the minute you have a change in power in those countries whether a dictator is somehow overthrown or dies then you will have instability they're going to be focused on their own economic and political stability versus maintaining uh, bilateral trade outside of the dollar. Yeah, I guess the last point would be just that that there is more trade happening outside of the dollar, but there's limits, right? I mean, I mean, how many rupees or, or rubles do you as a country want to build up before you can't take any more? There's actually more talk of trade outside of the dollar versus actual trade outside of the dollar that has increased. Um, Because if you look at Russia's efforts, they are struggling to raise enough interest in ruble-denominated bond issuances by local companies. Um, Bilateral trade between Russia and India is showing that uh, Russia doesn't know what to do with a giant stockpile of rupees because it's not as easily convertible as the dollar is. And so all these roadblocks are coming into play. So there is a lot more talk than um, reality uh, when it comes to moving away from the dollar. If a U.S. politician wanted to weaken the dollar, given the size of of the global FX market now, could, could they even do it? Yeah, and I recently wrote a story about this for Bloomberg News. You can look up my bio and you'll find it um, about, you know, because Trump, President Trump um, gave an interview, former President Trump gave an inter- interview to Bloomberg Business Week. And uh, he, in the, in the opening question, which was a broad stroke question about what kind of economy is good for the American people, he immediately brought up the, quote, big currency problem. Just the fact that the dollar is so strong. Now, of course, there's two definitions of a strong dollar. There is the strength in foreign exchange rate. And then just global dominance, hegemony, reigning over the financial markets and uh, global financial system. And um, in the story, I do unpack all the options that are available, um, options that the Trump, um, you know, his cadre of advisors have previously floated and might be looked at again. And it shows that, you know, I unpack with all the dollars and cents and figures and charts that the foreign exchange markets now, compared to when Treasury intervened more regularly in the 90s, 30 years ago, that market is massive. And the executive branch only has billions to use to influence it. Uh, and we're talking about a market that trades trillions a day. So any effort would fall flat. Um, you would need, you know, people talk about, oh, a Plaza Accord Part 2. Uh, you would need allies to join together. And it is hard to see allies coming together on that kind of an issue with the U.S., um, considering the uh, geopolitical fragmentation that has sort of persisted over the last couple of years. Um, you would also need central banks to uh, join in. And as I write in the story, I talked to um, an official who I quote on the record in the story from the W. Bush administration who told me, well, central banks used to be more compliant to the needs of finance ministers in the 80s and 90s. And so it's a different landscape for monetary policymakers as well. So it would be hard to get the Fed on board. And and I think Treasury would need the Fed on board to make it um, to, to create any kind of circumstance or condition in currency markets where the dollar could be weakened for longer than a blip in markets. So, Leah, I really appreciate you taking some time today. The book, I, I just I can't give you enough credit. Um, 
paper soldiers, you take such a unique path to how how we got to where we are today. I, I found it fascinating, and I read a lot of books on geopolitics and finance and the economy, and this was one of my favorites of the year. So hats off. Thank you for joining me. It was an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Before you leave, I want to invite you to join my Global Macro Update newsletter. This is a free service that comes out every Tuesday and Friday. I'll send you an email with my latest thoughts on geopolitics, economics, the markets, along with a link to the latest interview and a transcript. If you'd like to join us, hit the link in the description below or go to globalmacroupdate.com and join over 100,000 other Global Macro Update readers. I hope you join us. I'm Ed D'Agostino. Thanks for watching.